So, thank you for starting the recording. So, oops, you've muted yourself. <laughs> thank you. So, now we would like to start homomorphic encryption and encrypted search session. The first speaker is Mark Joy. The title is Balance No Adjacent Forms. So, could you start, please, Mark? So thank you, Atsuko. Every is okay on your side? Yes, that's good. Can you see my slides? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so this session is on, part of it at least is on fluomorphic encryption. And sometimes, so fluomorphic encryption is called the holy grail of crypto. And indeed, that's a beautiful technology. Um, and for example, it could be a solution to address data breaches. And what is nice with FHE, so fluomorphic encryption, is that data is end to end encrypted. So data is encrypted at rest, during transit, and even during its processing. So unlike traditional cryptography, so there is no need to decrypt to process the data. Um, now, if you want to implement FHE, so one of the main challenge is the noise. So today, all the construction we know for fluomorphic encryption produce noisy ciphertext. And when you play with those ciphertext, so when you uh, work over encrypted data, so the noise tend, uh, tends to increase. And if the noise exceeds a given threshold, so it might be the case that uh, the separate text cannot longer be decrypted. And so what I'd like to do in this talk is to find a way to better control the noise. And let's first uh, take a look at uh, one example. So assume that you have some private data X and you'd like to compute K times X. So the basic approach, so the most natural one would be first to get the encryption of X, then you multiply by K, and of course so you get encryption of K times X. But there is another way to, to do it. So something else you could do instead would be to first decompose K, so in some red X B, then you obtain the encryption of B to the I times X, then you take a linear combination of all the ciphertext and again, so it's easy to see that you'll get the encryption of K times X. So what's the advantage of the second approach over the first one? So remember that what we'd like to address is the noise issue. So if we look at the noise variance so in the first case, so we see that that uh, variance is proportional to the square of K. In the second case, so you can see that the noise variance is now proportional to the sum of the square of the digit of K. And you see that that second bond is slower than the first one, so that one is better. And what I'd like to do is to find the best possible decomposition. So the problem is the following one. So you are given some integer K, some red XB, and you'd like to find the best possible decomposition um, so that is written like this, such that the square, the sum of the square of the digit, so this is called the Euclidean weight, is minimal. And uh, there are already some uh, decomposition that we know. So for example, so when B is equal to two, so there is one that is pretty well known, which is the, the NAF, so the non-adjacent form. And for that form, so we know that the number of non-zero digits is minimal. So the number of one and minus one is minimal in that form, so in the NAF. And because of that, so, I mean, it's easy to see that that one will uh, minimize the Euclidean way. Another case that is not too difficult to deal with is when the radix is odd, so when B is odd. So what you can always do for a node radix B, you can always decompose an integer using digit in the set minus B minus one over two up to B minus one over two. So the, the form you get is unique 
And it can be shown that uh, actually, so it also minimizes the equilibrium weight. So the difficult case is when uh, you have an even red XB that is larger than two. Uh, but in that case, so there is a very uh, simple but uh, useful observation is that when you have some decomposition, so like this one, so something you can always do, of course, you can flip the sign of one digit, so this one, and what you have to do is just to propagate the sign to the, sign, to, to, to the, to the next digit. And that gives you another representation that is valid. So you may need to, to propagate again and again and again, but at the end, so you get a valid representation of your uh, integer k. So let's take an example. So assume, for example, that radix b is equal to four. Uh, so two, two is a valid representation for 10. Uh, what you could do, so you could flip the digits, so you get one minus two, two, which is another valid representation for 10 in radix four. You can also flip the digit and you end up with minus two, minus one and one. And this is the minimal form. So you, you cannot do better. And so intuition tells you that, well, uh, it seems that what we have to do is when we have a two followed by a minus two, then we flip. So we flip that, that, that two. And the same, so if you have a two followed by, by another two. And actually, so this is essentially what we'll do to get uh, the optimal form. And so I just show you the algorithm. Here it is. Um, so as an input, you take an integer k, and as an output, so you get that optimal form. So I call it the BNAF. Um, the digits are in that range. So uh, between uh, minus b over two, up to b over two, and this is why it's called balanced. Um, so what is the, the, main, the main step in that recording is this one. So there is that uh, if branching here with two conditions, so this one and this one, and in, if one of those two conditions is satisfied, then you have uh, to flip, you just flip the, the digit value. Um, so some uh, special cases, so when B is odd, so it simplifies to just one condition and actually, so this is just the usual balanced form. So using uh, that set of digits and that one is known to be, to be unique. Um, when we have B equal to two, so it's not too difficult to see that this is another way to get enough. So the, the regular one, and so, I mean, that's not a surprise. And so the, the difficult case, so when uh, B is even and larger than two, uh, so we need to check those two conditions. And this is the general algorithm to get uh, the BNAF recording. So it's called BNAF because uh, it's enough when B is equal to two and balanced because the set of digits that is used is balanced. Okay. Um, so the main results. Uh, so first, uh, we show that BNAF is unique. And more importantly, so we show that the Euclidean weight of uh, BNAF is minimal. So you cannot do better. Uh, so in the paper, so we also uh, analyze the digit distribution uh, and that allows us to compute the expectation and the variance and what is nice is that the expectation is zero. So the distribution is centered, I mean, which is also a useful property. So to sum up, uh, so I did present a new form to uh, decompose an integer. Um, so uh, you can do exactly the same using modular integer. So that's in the paper. We show that NAF always exists and is unique. It's optimal, so meaning that the Euclidean weight is minimal. Uh, we analyze the digit distribution and also in the paper, so you can find uh, several cryptographic application and mostly uh, for uh, fully homomorphic encryption. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Do we have any questions from the audience? If not, I'll, I'll uh, so you're, you analyzed, 
Oh, sorry. One, one audience has handing hands. Ilya? Oh, okay. Okay, you go ahead. Okay, just you, you analyze this for a particular radix. Can you give some intuition for why different radixes come up in practice in, in FHE evaluation? So typically, so you use a power of two because that's more convenient. And uh, I mean, this is mostly used in uh, what is known as the gadget decomposition. And so the size of B, I mean, um, tells you, uh, I mean, give you actually the, the decomposition. So, I mean, it's always a trade-off. Um, so, I mean, a smaller B, I mean, will increase the size of the encryption, but uh, give you a more fine uh, control of the noise, while a larger value for B, I mean, it's the, the opposite effect. I mean, that's also used in a GSW crypto system. So, I mean, this is a well-known trick to, to manage the noise. Okay, um, great. Uh, thank you very much, Mark. If there's no more questions, we'll move to the next speaker. Which I guess I'll introduce. So the, this talk is gonna be given by uh, Jun Young. The title of the talk is Efficient Boolean Search Over Encrypted Data with Reduced Leakage. And Junyong, can you go ahead and uh, share your screen? Uh, can everyone see my screen or? Not yet. Uh, is it not shared? Right. Oh, sorry. Uh, can you see my screen? Yep, that looks great. Well, okay, so um, yeah, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Junyang, and I'm here to present our work titled uh, Efficient Boolean Search Over Encrypted Data with Reduced Leakage. So um, there has been uh, extensive studies on encrypted search and uh, many different approaches have been proposed with uh, different trade-offs. And um, in our work specifically, we focus on structured encryption, which considers a more uh, relaxed privacy requirement with the hope of achieving small overhead uh, necessary for uh, practical applications. Uh, a little bit of a preliminaries, um, a multi-map data structure maintains a set of labels to uh, value um, tuple pairs. And the multiple data structure supports a query operation that receives a label and returns a value tuple associated with the given label. And um, you'll consider the extended uh, Boolean multimap that enables more complex query operations beyond simply just retrieving um, value tuple associated with a single label. And um, essentially, a Boolean multimap is associated with the supported class of Boolean formula query over the labels. And in our work, we specifically focus on um, conjunctive queries and the CNF uh, formulae. And um, finally, uh, encrypted Boolean multimap is just a structured encryption for uh, Boolean multimaps. Um, our work is uh, largely influenced by the following three uh, papers. And especially, um, we'll especially reference the BIEX scheme uh, presented in KM17 uh, throughout our work. So um, we present new encrypted Boolean multimaps, which are adaptively secure, um, non-interactive, have similar or better efficiency, and have uh, reduced leakage compared to uh, prior works. Uh, in particular, we obtain new constructions for handling conjunctions and CNF queries with reduced leakage and has uh, have uh, optimal communication complexity. Um, and furthermore, our scheme only uses a uh, symmetric key parameters and ends up being uh, quite practical. Uh, we start by presenting the approach to handling uh, conjunctive queries using uh, previous works such as uh, KM17. Um, so consider the conjunctive query uh, L1 and L2 and all the way up to LQ. Um, the main idea of BIEX is to decompose the query into Q minus one, two conjunctions, where each is computed independently such that the resulting response sets are all PRF evaluations under the key solely depending on the first label L1. And 
essentially the server can retrieve mm of l1 and l2 mm of l1 and l3 etc independently and compute the intersection of all q minus one sets and uh, return the response to the client um, however uh, there are several drawbacks to using this approach uh, first the scheme leaks the volumes of the q minus one two conjunctions so the server can learn volumes of more complex queries and um, secondly, the server must perform computation, computation on the order of the sum of the size of the response sets from the two conjunctions, which seems quite wasteful as the response sets of MM of L1 and L2 is already a superset of the final response. And um, to address these drawbacks, uh, we present a new filtering algorithm, which is going to be the core of our um, um, paper which will be utilized by our, by our uh, construction uh, conch filter. Um, the main idea is to only retrieve MM of L1 and L2 and do the filtering on this set instead of retrieving all of MM of L1 and L3, MM, MM of L1 and L4, and so on, like it does in uh, KM17. Um, to do this, uh, we maintain an additional data structure that allows a server to check whether a value uh, V in MM of L1 and L2 belongs to um, MM of like L1 and L3, MM of L1 and L4, and so on directly um, without having to retrieve them. Um, retrieve them. And um, this data structure is constructed in such a way that the leakage is significantly reduced. Um, and at a high level, um, this data structure is just a set of uh, double PRF evaluations of the values stored in the encrypted multimaps. And one can check for the membership by simply applying a PRF in the response set and then checking whether this uh, resulting evaluation is in this set and then do the filtering um, on the response. Um, and it turns out our uh, conch filter scheme has smaller query leakage and with the set of leakage being identical to uh, BIEX and KM17. And uh, it also turns out that the storage and the token size also turns out to be identical to um, KM17. And um, so our, we also present um, the CNF filter, which handles uh, CNF queries. Um, and um, using a clever reform reformulation of the given CNF uh, formula and using our filtering algorithm again, we can actually construct a new um, CNF scheme, uh, CNF filter, which has a small leakage and better computation cost compared to um, BIEX. Um, so it's a bit lengthy to uh, go into details on this here, but uh, please see the full paper for anyone interested. Um, so this table shows micro benchmarks for the search time of the RCNF filter and uh, BIX on randomly chosen queries. And we actually see that our CNF filter scheme outperforms BIEX in all scenarios, and in some cases, as much as a uh, 20x faster. And the uh, above line charts um, show search token sizes of the CNF filter and uh, BIEX. And we see that in practice, our token size of the CNF filter is almost twice as small as that of BIEX. And lastly, um, this table sh shows storage and setup time of a CNF filter and BIEX. Um, since a CNF filter maintains an additional data structure, we observe that the storage size and setup time are generally larger for CNF filter. But we see that the storage size is only 20 to 25% larger. And we believe that the extra setup time is a reasonable um, trade off given the leakage communication and the survey computation um, improvements that our scheme provides. And uh, that is it. Great. Thank you. Once again, um, any questions from the audience? So just while while we're waiting, um, can you give some intuition on why you couldn't? So you're essentially, except for the first leaking triples of volumes, why you couldn't extend this to any like constant number of of operands or literals? Um, constant. Uh, so, so like why? 
couldn't could you put three conjunctions in the outer PRF evaluation? What keeps you from being able to do that? So that would actually increase the storage size to, I guess, like, so right now the storage size is a quadratic like in a BIEX, but if we um, make it triple, then that would actually make the storage size um, like the, the, to the power of three. So. Um, that essentially is a reason why we uh, had to um, keep it as only a double PRF. So this would keep the um, storage size asymptotically the same as the uh, encrypted multimap, how it's constructed, yeah. All right, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jun Young. And Vincent, can you share? Great, so the, the third speaker of the session is gonna be Vincent Suka, who's gonna be talking about revisiting homomorphic encryption schemes for finite fields. Can you hear me? Ah, Vincent, your microphone appears. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. Keep talking. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm so sorry. That was that was my fault. Please continue. Okay. So before diving uh, into the subject, I will quickly remind some basics about homomorphic encryption, even though Mark already did it. So essentially, homomorphic encryption allows users to perform computation directly over encrypted data. And in a nutshell, this means that if you have two encrypted messages, you can compute uh, an encryption of their sum or their product without having access to the decryption key. Now, the problematic thing with homomorphic encryption is that uh, each ciphertext carries some noise, which grows as computations are performed, and we can only decrypt a message if the noise is not too large. So this means essentially that ciphertext have a computational budget. And the most expensive operation in terms of both computational complexity and noise introduced is usually the homomorphic multiplication. And the way of handling this noise growth depends essentially on the scheme you consider. And in this work, we've focused on optimizing this operation and for the BGV and BFV scheme. So in BGV and BFV, the ciphertext are represented modulo in integer Q. And in BGV, the message is encrypted into the least significant digits of a ciphertext while the noise is scaled by some parameter T to lie into the most significant digit. As long as the noise is small enough, the product of two ciphertext will not overwrap modulo Q, and thus we can compute it directly modulo Q. But because the noise grows quadratically, you see on the picture that I won't be able to perform another multiplication after this one if I wanted to. So the idea of the scheme is to handle this quadratic noise growth, uh, is to scale the ciphertext down by some factor before the next multiplication in such a way that the noise will also be scaled down to a minimal level. That is equivalent to removing the red part of the noise on my picture. So that after this, I will be able to perform another multiplication. And it is therefore crucial to have a precise estimate of the size of the noise carried by your ciphertext to scale it down appropriately. If the noise is underestimated, then it won't be reduced enough and if it's overestimated, then we will lose some computational budget uselessly. In the BFV encryption scheme, it's the opposite. It's a message that is scaled up to be encoded into the most significant digit. And because of this, when we perform a multiplication, the product of the two ciphertext will necessarily uh, overwrap modulo Q. And if the ciphertext, uh, if the product overwrap modulo Q, then we lose the product of the two messages. So to prevent this, we need to add another temporary modulus P to perform the multiplication and prevent the product of overwrapping. The downside of this approach is that the multiplication node has to be performed modulo PQ and is less efficient than for BGV. 
And then to get back a ciphertext <coughs> uh, representing modulo Q, we basically scale the ciphertext down. And like in BGV, the noise, this will scale the noise down similarly. And since we have to perform this scaling automatic uh, after e each multiplication, the noise is also scaled uh, automatically, and we don't need to have any dynamic noise estimation in the ciphertext. So in theory, uh, BGV and BFV are equivalent, and we can even convert ciphertext from one scheme to the other. However, uh, in practice, BGV is faster, while BFE is simpler to use since it does not require to handle the noise growth uh, dynamically. It was also noticed recently then, uh, uh, by Costa, Stein, and Player that when the plain text modulus T is large, BFE has a more important noise growth than BGV. In this work, we've focused on reducing the gap in practice between the two schemes. Uh, first, we modified the BFV encoding, which was responsible of the noise growth observed by Costa, Schlein, and Player in such a way that now both schemes have essentially the same noise bound. Second, we modified uh, BFV homomorphic multiplication in order to reduce the size of the second integer P, which improves the computational complexity of the procedure. And to improve it further, we also propose a leveled variant of BFV multiplication in which the product is performed internally modulo P prime Q prime, which is smaller than PQ. Uh, and the last uh, contribution was to propose the static so, sort of static variant of BGV where everything is set up at key generation and we don't need any dynamic noise estimation. We also propose some other optimization for BFE, and in particular, we improved the RNS decryption procedure of Alevi, Polyakov, and Shoup, uh, removing the constraint on the, on the size of the moduli. So overall, if you look at the performance of the different scheme we studied, you notice that the, our new variant of BGV, the blue line, is a uh, faster than uh, the original uh, BFE, the purple one, and the level variant of BFE, the red line, mimic the behavior of BGV. The most surprising point on this uh, graphics is that our variant of BGV appears to be smaller, uh, at least for small moduli, than uh, at the first level than BFP. Uh, this is actually a side effect of our implementation since uh, every moduli well, when the size of the moduli in BGV depends on the plain text modulus. So when the plain text modulus is small, you have small moduli and you can have more of them. So when the plain text modulus is small, we have a lot of moduli. And uh, since each moduli is represented on a different machine world and the experiments were run in a single thread, uh, threaded mode, we have to compute a lot of entities uh, sequentially. So that's why we have this gap of performance between the two schemes, but this can be easily overcome if you choose to trunk the small moduli together on the same machine world. Well, that's essentially everything I wanted to say. So thank you for your attention. And I will be happy to answer your question uh, if you have some. Thank you. So is there any question or comment? from audience. Okay, so I have a question. So it is very nice result. So I want to know the difference. So now you show the result in the case of t equal to and t equal to two is 16 and plus one. So is there any, you know, good t that output good result uh, it, well the for per, for regarding the performance the yeah. shape of t does not impact uh, well the, the shape of t does not impact the performance it mm -hmm. impa it may impact the way you encode the message but the procedure itself won't, will only be impacted for bgv by the size of t so, and mm -hmm. not uh, by uh, its shape so for the performance, there is no particular T that, uh, well, not a particular shape of T that could be, could result in better performances. 
Okay. Thank you. So, is there any other question? Okay, thank you again. And let's move to the next talk. Uh, can you see the slide? Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, I'll start. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sungwan Kim. Today I present trend ciphering framework for approximate homomorphic encryption. This is a joint work with Jihoon, Jincheol, Byung-hak, Juhi, Juyoung, Dokje, and Hyojin. Now let's begin from homomorphic encryption. Homomorphic encryption is an encryption scheme that enables addition and multiplication over encrypted data. Someone might think about partially homomorphic encryption, but when we say HE in this presentation, it supports both addition and multiplication. There are well-known examples of HE FE schemes in the previous slides for modular ring and SKKS for complex ring. Recent homomorphic encryption schemes have two demerits, slow encryption speed and large ciphertext expansion. As you can see in this table, encryption speed and ciphertext expansion might be quite an overload. To resolve the demerits of HE, Lauter et al. proposed transciphering framework, which is conversion from symmetric ciphertext to a homomorphic ciphertext. Imagine that a client want to delegate computation to a server while all the data are encrypted. The client sends homomorphically encrypted symmetric key to server once and encrypts all the messages with symmetric cipher. Then given symmetric ciphertext, the server evaluates the decryption circuit to make homomorphically encrypted messages. Using the trend ciphering framework, the client can encrypt fast and get smaller ciphertext. However, for real numbers, there have been no transciphering framework. To make a transciphering framework for real numbers, we observe some similarities between CKKS and FB schemes. The first observation is that CKKS and FB schemes have similar encryption algorithms. Here we wrote down the formula of the encryption algorithms in both schemes. As you can see, they are very similar and the major difference is the delta. For CKKS, the delta is scaling factor which preserves precision, while delta in FV is a big scalar to make plain text modulo T. The second observation is that CKKS and FV have similar plain text space. Both schemes use a plain text in polynomial ring ZX with bounded coefficients. In this figure, we give a pictorial description of two schemes. These bar stands for coefficients. They are different in the size of delta. We found out that those two schemes can be converted to each other by bootstrapping. Now we, pre we present RTF transciphering framework, which is a new transciphering framework for real numbers. RTF means real to finite field. The overall diagram is on the right. The client has a real message M and convert it to integers modulo T by scaling and rounding off. Here T should be large enough to preserve predetermined precision. The client generates key stream from a non-space stream cipher over ZT. By adding the key stream to the scaled message, the client can get a symmetric ciphertext C. The client needs to send an FV encrypted symmetry key K to the server. The server, roughly speaking, transcipher to FV ciphertext and bootstrap it to a CKKS ciphertext. We also made an HE friendly cipher HERA over ZT to use in the RTF framework. Like Rasta, it is a block cipher like 
stream cipher, outputting a vector in ZT16. Hera is an SPN with randomized key schedule. On the right, this figure describes the round function of Hera. Hera is composed of AES light MDS matrix, component wise cube map, randomized key schedule, and fixed constant input. This table shows the recommended number of rounds with respect to each attack. We analyze the security of HERA against linear and differential cryptanalysis, linearization, interpolation attack, GCD attack, and Gravner basis attack. The number of rounds of HERA is the maximum of each column. As we propose the first trend ciphering framework for real numbers, there's not many things to compare. We compare RTF combined with HERA to LWE to RLW conversion and CKKS only environment. We experiment LWE to RLWE conversion using Open Pegasus library in this paper below. The CKKS only environment is experimented using Lettigo library. The first RTF HERA is full batching instance, and the second RTF HERA is said to have the same number of slots as LWE to RW conversion. We emphasize that the red part, ciphertext size, ciphertext expansion ratio, and the client side performance is significantly better than the CKKS only environment. That's it. Thank you for listening. All right. Thank you. Do we have uh, questions from the audience? And I'll, I'll do the well, while we're waiting. Do you, do you have a sense of what type of circuits you have to be evaluating for the, the client-side encryption to become the bottleneck? Uh, it's, it's like uh, it was uh, well known to mu multiplication, but I think it was a matrix, mu matrix multiplication is uh, harder when matrix is randomly generated. So we fix the matrix. Yeah. So, sorry, am, what am do you I, mean? Am, am I wrong? Uh, no, I just mean, what do you mean by you fix the matrix? Uh, I mean that uh, it's well known that there is a bottleneck for multiplication. So the linear layers are usually randomized but we think that it was wrong. So we fixed and do not uh, generate random and matrices for the cipher. Good, okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, we'll um, move on to the, the last uh, talk of the, the session, um, which is gonna be given by uh, Samuel. The title is Improve po ah, Programmable Bootstrapping with Larger Precision and Efficient Arithmetic Circuits for TFHE. And uh, say, oh, sorry, not by, Samuel's not speaking, it's by Jean-Baptiste, sorry. Go ahead, Jean-Baptiste. Yes, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, small, small replacement uh, <laughs> at the last moment. So yeah, we present uh, our work, which is entitled Improved Programmable Strapping with Larger Precision and Efficient Arithmetic Circuits for TFHE. This is a joint work with uh, Ilaria Kiloti, Damien Ligier, and Samuel Tapp. So first, uh, what is FHE? So FHE is a cryptographic paradigm which allows us to compute over um, encrypted data. So the idea that in fully homomorphic encryption, we are able to make addition and also multiplication over encrypted data so that at the end, we obtain an encrypted version of the addition over the plain text or the multiplication over the plain text. So this is quite general and we are able to evaluate almost every circuit on every possible types of data, which might be bits, integer or real messages. Um, the thing we have to look on uh, FHE is the noise because due to security reason, we have to add noise when encrypting. And the fact is when we are making some operation, this noise will grow. So we have to be sure when evaluating a circuit that this noise doesn't get over a threshold so that the decryption will give us the correct results. 
So magically, there is a breakthrough in FHE, which is called bootstrapping, and it's quite simplified the, the evaluation of circuits since it allows us to reduce the noise. So bootstrapping takes one ciphertext in, as input, which is a LW ciphertext in our case, plus a public key, which is a bootstrapping key. And so with the bootstrapping algorithm, at the end, it will output the same ciphertext with the noise which has been reduced. In our case, we are particularly interested in the TFHE bootstrapping because it takes another parameter, which is a lookup table, so a representation of a discrete function as a lookup table. And so as long as we refresh the noise with the bootstrapping, we'll also be able to evaluate, a, to evaluate the lookup table, which means that for a, a ciphertext which encrypts X, at the end of the bootstrapping, we'll, we are able to have the encryption of L of X and the noise has been reduced. So this is the particularity of the TFHE bootstrapping. Um, in the following slides, we are referring to the programmable bootstrapping as the PBS. So uh, the PBS has some limitation and in this contribution, we want to overcome these, these limitations. So the first one is that during a PBS, we are only able to evaluate one function. So we propose a new solution in order to be um, able to evaluate more function during one PBS. The other limitation is about uh, the requirement that we have in the, in the programmable strapping. So to be able to uh, correctly evaluate the PBS, we, are, we have a, a bit of padding which has to be known in the plain text. Otherwise said, the intuition is that we can use only half on the precision space of the message space during bootstrapping. Otherwise the bootstrap will not be correct. In order to overcome this limitation, uh, we'll introduce the BFV multiplication into the TFHG scheme, and we propose two versions of an algorithm, which is called the WooPBS for without padding programmable bootstrapping. So first, let's have a look of, on the PBS minilutes. So without getting into details, the idea of the PBS minilutes is to trick a little the PBS to have a more generalized version, which allows us to define a new parameter, theta, and this theta will give us the possibility to evaluate two to the power of theta functions on the same input. Which is interesting in this approach is that it offers the multiple instruction single data paradigm to the PBS, and that the cost is almost the cost of only one PBS. The only difference is that we have to compute multiple sample extract for as many functions as we want to compute, but in practice, the sample extract is almost free. The second idea is to introduce a new operation in TFHE, which is the LW product. To do so, we start from the RLW product of BFV. So the idea is to have two RLWs and to make a computation, which is more or less a tensor product and a linearization. And at the end, we obtain the product of the two messages as an RLW. So with simple tricks, like the key switch and sample extract, we are able to extend this product to LWEs. Now, the tedious part of including the, the BFV product into TFHE was the noise analysis. And we have done this noise analysis to be sure that it exists a practice parameter, practical parameters to do so with the TFHE schemes, since the parameters from BFV and TFHE are quite different. With this new tool, we are now able to define the WOO PBS, so the PBS without padding it. So first we start with off message and we want to compute the first PBS will be the PBS computing the function L. So now at the end, we obtain plus or minus L of M the evaluation. And in fact, this is why we need in the classical PBS uh, a padding bit. In fact, we ensure the correctness and the correctness is unsure up to the sign. So if we remove this padding bit, at the end, we are not sure about the sign of the function we have computed. So at the end, we have the encryption of plus or minus L of M and we don't know this sign. To counter this, we are computing another, uh, we have to compute another PBS, which will be the sign. And so, which is interesting is the PBS will be computed on the same input. So in the end, we are going to have the sign of the PBS, but it is also encrypted. However, since it is applied on the same input, in the end, we know that the sign will be the same for the two PBSs, so that we are going to have plus L of M and plus one, or minus L of M and minus one. And then with the simple information, um, this simple observation that L of M times one is equal to minus L of M minus time minus one, in the end, using the product we have just introduced before, we are able to obtain the correct result of the PBS. So in conclusion, we have seen uh, not in details that we have the, now the BFV multiplication to the FHE, and this is used to compute the um, without padding PBS. 
and also they are a simple method to compute many loots during a single PBS. In the paper, they, in the paper there is mer, much more result than that, uh, which uh, are another uh, version of the PBS, which might be more efficient, and many, many optimization of the two versions of the PBSs. Moreover, we propose a generic type noise analysis, which might be seen as a tool to uh, generally analyze a new TFH operation. Moreover, there is a lot of uh, applications of these uh, two of these new tools, uh, which are the uh, generic circuit bootstrapping or large precision PBS or more efficient gate bootstrapping, for example. Uh, it also raises some open problems. Uh, more, for example, uh, we want to uh, have a, a fast and quite precise, uh, quite precise uh, fast Fourier transform in order to accelerate and reduce the parameter during the, the GFHC computations. Moreover, we want to reduce the noise growth during the WPBS because it has some cost on the noise. And lastly, we want to improve the key switching in order to globally improve the performances during the LW products. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, clap. <laughs> um, just while while we're waiting to see if there's any questions, uh, I want to thank all the all the speakers today. Um, five really nice talks. Um, just I'll I'll ask kind of a silly question: Is is the size of the LUT that you're evaluating like? Is, is there any bound on the complexity of the lookup table you're evaluating or you can encode an arbitrary function as, as long as the, the plain text like feel, or as long as the plain text lookup makes sense? Yeah, you're kind of right. In fact, the size of the lookup table depends on the size of the message. So the size of the lookup table will be two to the power of the size of the message. Since we have to, uh, to have at least one, um, one association for each of the in entry of the message. In practice, it's much more larger than that since we have to make some redundancy to be sure that the computation of the PBS is correct because we have to deal with the error. So which this is quite dependent from the TFHE parameters in the end. It, it, it just is, um, you, you didn't mention it, but if, if you have a pa uh, a pack ciphertext, a, a SIMD ciphertext where you have multiple message slots, can you can you apply the techniques there as well or so yeah so but in tfhe um, maybe the most silly way to have pack thing will be to have an rwe as input and so we cannot directly ap apply this so the idea will be first to have sample extract to have some lwes and on each of the lwes you have to apply the pbs okay yeah. Do do we have other other questions? All right, let's um, thank all the the speakers again. This uh, great session. Really appreciate everybody's time and attention.